Hello and welcome. Hello and welcome to our first episode of Let's All Go to the Library. Whoop, whoop. I'm Nico. I'm Tyler. Or and Tea Kettle. Oh, oh you boy. already messed it up. Oh, you already boy. messed it up. I've never. I've been revealed. You've been revealed. All right. So explain to the viewers what this new show, this brand new show, is going to be, Tyler. This is the pilot, first of all. The pilot. But so there might be some refined changes. But explain to the people what what Let's All Go to the Library is going to be about. Okay, so Let's All Go to the Library. We get, we're going to take a movie that is culturally, historically impactful, and kind of like talk about like what made it so, or like what what's great about it and uh yeah we're just gonna be going diving deep diving in deep meaning basically uh if you want to get the most out of it you should have seen the movie or if you don't care about spoilers that's cool too yes or if you've at least heard about this movie because in light of halloween in light of october Mm -hmm. we have watched a movie that is historically significant to not just horror cinema not just german expressionist cinema but cinema in general and of course it's the guy who keeps flickering the lights, Nosferatu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. SpongeBob reference if you didn't. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. So, uh, w- w- what can you tell us about Nosferatu? So, I mean... Nosferatu is a, it's a German expressionist horror film directed by F.W. Murnau. Is that how you pronounce it? I think it's Murnau, yeah. Murnau. Mm-hmm. Sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, it was an unauthorized adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, permission was refused by the Stoker estate, leading to changes in the names and details. Uh, this was the only film to be released under the Prana Films, uh, the production company, um, uh, as the uh, Stoker estate sued for copyright infringement and won. Really? All copies of Nusferatu were to be burned, leaving the one surviving print to be copied over the years. Really? I didn't know that. Nusferatu found a cult following after that, becoming an early example of a cult film. Now the film thrives as movie references and parodies, cementing it as both an iconic piece of pop culture and a mandatory viewing during the Halloween season. Nusferatu was not the first film to be based on Bram Stoker's Dracula. The first preceded it by a year, and it was called Dracula's Death. Loosely adapted from the book, the film only exists today as a couple newspaper review clippings. No way. It's basically just a a name on a manifest. Yes, because I know that I did hear... About how the estate, particularly um, Bram Stoker's widow, right, refused mm. the rights to Dracula. So they had to change uh, some details, like it's not Count Dracula in Count the Orlock. actual story, it's Count Orlock. Mm-hmm. And also they, they changed the look of Count Orlock a lot. But Nosferatu, um, the vampire, as they say, mm-hmm. has become just as like culturally significant and just as like uh, impactful as Dracula. You yeah, know? Pr- I mean, pretty much, yeah. So this leads me to my first question for you. Okay, hit me. Uh, how did you like Nusferatu, and where does it rank amongst other Dracula adaptations you've seen? Okay, so <clears throat> if you watched my review on Stardust, I did give it five stars. Ooh. And I gave it five stars because I, I specifically said, like I said in the beginning, this is more than just hist- a historical movie for the, the horror genre or German expressionism. It's historic in just... In the language of cinema, the way la- the way cinema is told with cinematography, which was groundbreaking at the time, special effects, like things like stop motion were even in this film, and that was like mind blowing back mm-hmm. then. You see these things in this film that still hold up, like certain shots that still actually creep me out. Like spoiler alert, at the end when she, when he's drinking the blood of uh, what's her name, Mary. Yeah. Like. That's a creepy shot when he's just like in the corner and then there's only that overhead lighting yes. from the room. That is creepy. And that just shows how good uh, Murnau was at directing. And uh, I don't know the cinematographer of this film, director of photography, but... We'll get, we'll get to that. <laughs> all right, all right. But they every shot is so planned out and it, it, it's almost like a painting. Mm-hmm. Every, every shot. Every, like every frame of painting. I know that's been said a lot, but it's true with this film. And it still holds up, so I really, I really enjoyed it. And I even said in my Stardust review, though, that it is a 1920s silent film. Mm-hmm. So the the layman might have a hard time enjoying it because of that. I think this film at this point in time is mostly suited for horror uh, enthusiasts or cinephiles, and we're both. And that that kind of pains me to say that, but it's just that's just a fact of the matter is that people. 
they don't really accept black and white films, silent films nowadays. This is it's the type kinda, of it's film sad. that's for the for the people that would become filmmakers for the Dracula yes. adaptations that Absolutely. the mainstream audiences Absolutely. would do. And speaking of that, how it ranks up to other Dracula adaptations, I haven't seen many. I will be real. Mm-hmm. Um, and the ones I have seen are not that great. Um, <laughs> but I will say Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula is okay. There's some really bad performances in that, in my personal oh, opinion. Boy. I know where the bastard sleeps. <sighs> you guys listening might think Keanu Reeves is like... He's untouchable. He's untouchable. He's like one of the biggest stars right now. But there was a time when people... Keanu Reeves was that actor where people would be like, why do people keep hiring this guy? (laughs) Like, he was that actor. And Bram Stoker's Dracula was definitely during that time period. Yeah, he he found his place in cinema. He did. He definitely wasn't like Shakespearean types of And they kept trying to cast him in like that Shakespearean... I don't know why, but they did. Yeah. And anyway, there's some really bad moments in Bram Stoker's Dracula uh, mm-hmm. by Francis Ford Coppola, but um, this is better. I would I will say this is better just because the way it's I mean Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, which is the one I recall the most because I've actually never seen the Universal one, believe it or not, with oh, Bela really? Lugosi. Yeah, which is crazy. I've seen clips, but not the full thing. I've seen a couple other vampire movies like Lost Boys and all that, but those aren't Dracula movies. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to like limit it to specifically Dracula films. So this compared to Bram Stoker's Dracula, you know, by uh, Francis Ford Coppola. I'll just call it Coppola's Dracula, yeah. just for the sake of argument. Sure. Um, Coppola's Dracula is kind of forgettable. Mm-hmm. You forget about it, like, after it's done. And I understand that it's very, very accurate to the book, like, more than most adaptations of Dracula. True. But the cardinal sin of that movie is that it's forgettable. You know, uh, the production design is great, but it's forgettable. Here, this is, for Nosferatu, it's almost more minimal but it's more memorable at the same time. And it sticks with you. And I think that might yeah. be because of the aesthetic. Like, the old-time, like, silent aesthetic. Mm-hmm. It just, it, it resonated with me more. For sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. this is, I think, the, the quintessential uh, Dracula film. Yeah. I mean... It, it, would it be between that or Universal's, probably, right? Would you uh, say? That one's good. Mm-hmm. But this one, man, it, it's great. That, that one is... is I like it so much because it's so progressive. Like the th- the thing that happened at like the the hour and like fifteen minute mark of mm. this film happened within like twenty minutes of the Dracula film, and then they had so much more to do uh-huh. after that. Yeah, and they they really didn't dwell on on too many moments in that movie. It was just like rapid fire, one thing after the next. So it yes. was more entertaining. But this film is definitely. It's it's all about the miasma of it all, the mm-hmm. the, the atmosphere. Absolutely, and uh, and it's drenched in atmosphere. It's so it's even so drenched. <laughs> even, even because here's a little piece of trivia. I don't know if this is in your notes, but it's pretty obvious when you watch the film that all the di- they did day for night throughout the film. So mm-hmm. all the nighttime scenes are tinted in blue because the camera stock during this time couldn't pick up uh, night shoots unless they were lit like crazy Mm -hmm. um so they did day for night in this film and even when the nighttime is so obviously shot during the day it's still drenched in like creepy atmosphere and that's a tough thing to do totally Mm -hmm. yep absolutely so moving on Mm mm-hmm uh the look of the film was inspired by artist hugo steiner prague uh, an obvious influence given Prana Films wanted to produce supernatural and occult films. Preg was an up-and-coming gothic-style illustrator. Albin Grau, who did most of the production design for Nusferatu, based even the look of Nusferatu on Preg's sketch from the book The Golem. And I have something for you to see. It's it, it's a very good look at that. That wow. was the, the so that's the inspiration for Nusferatu. Yes. Wow. It does kind of look like him. It it does. It kind of looks like. Like an alien almost, too, because his eyes are so squinted. Yes, yeah. Dang. He just looks kind of soulless. Like He does. He, he, I don't know. It's, it's creepy. It is creepy. I'll have to put that on the screen. <laughs> Question two. What did you make of the film's aesthetic? So oh, okay. Let's dive deep into let's it. Let's dive deeper into it. Yes. Um, well, like all German expressionist films, there is heavy emphasis on minimalism angles and frames within frames and that's one thing i noticed about this film i really liked the frames within frames Mm -hmm. that kept happening um the most iconic shot one of like the two or three most iconic shots that even people who haven't seen nosferatu 
have, like they know the shot is when he's framed in the door. You know, he's framed like in he he's framed by the door frame, which kind of puts emphasis on him. Yes, actually, that's part of the whole the whole Prague thing. Is mm-hmm. I, I was going through his his stuff. He did have the tendency to have. Uh, frames within frames, yeah. even in his pictures. Literally, I mean, that photo you just showed me, kind of, he was in a, he was frames within frames. And also, adding to that photo as well, he's also, the golem is also, like, drenched in shadow. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, uh, Count Orlock is drenched in, in shadow. Yes. You know, even if he's fully lit, the, his background is, like, dark. And that is creepy, and it just adds to the creepy, disturbing aesthetic and it adds to the reasons why this film still holds up. This film is defined by its aesthetic. Yes. I mean, without it, it really doesn't have... Because it's a very streamlined version of the Dracula story. Yes. There's really... There are hints that, of it. There, there, yeah, but there, in, in all honesty, the this, this story doesn't have a lot of meat to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really just takes its time with getting from place to place and just kind of like admiring the scenery especially i i i I find um a lot of greatness in uh the locations uh i think that's part of why it it, like helps transport Mm -hmm. you um i really like that they have like the kind of storybook style and when going into the uh the lore and stuff like that they flip through the pages like literally yeah yep Mm -hmm. um it's just it's everything man it's even his his mannerisms. Yeah. Like, you see his, his him for the first time, his composure, his posture yeah. is is his own. Yes. Max Shrek, that's his... The, the actor, the yeah. The actor, yeah. And this is the only film he ever did, right? Or, like, one of two or, like, something like he, that? He, didn't, he did not do a lot. Um, it's actually kind of interesting. Not a lot of people, even his biographer doesn't really know much about him. Dang. <laughs> He's a complete mystery. Wasn't there like a rumor that he didn't even exist, Max Shrek? There was a rumor that he was, in fact, a vampire. Yes. Playing and, a vampire, and, which was based on the, the film that you yeah, showed me. Yeah, Shadow of the, uh, of the Vampire. Yeah. yeah. Which I actually did see as well. Really? I did. I did. <laughs> we'll probably talk about that later. But uh, yeah, that was the inspiration for... For that movie. Yeah, and it was based on that rumor. Yes, yes. Um, also, adding to the aesthetic and the cinematography, too, let's just talk about... I know I, I've talked about the shadow play in this film, but, I mean, one of the most iconic shots, again, I said, is the door frame, but also the shadow of Nosferatu going up the stairs. Yes. Like, that is iconic. And they've they've um, they've done it in other films like Halloween. Which with, is which is interesting, because we're going to have to come, come back to that at some mm-hmm. point. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it makes it makes for a really good shot mm-hmm. for sure, and I think that's another shot that no matter even if you haven't seen it, I've seen that shot many of times yes. just floating around the internet. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and you you were saying something about um, the minimalism of the the sets and stuff, and how that's kind of the the case for expressionist films. Mm-hmm. I found that it was like kind of strangely minimal yep. in this film compared to like something like Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, yes. which takes a lot of time uh, hand painting and stuff like that. It's very this, surreal. It's more surreal than... Yes, and this is just like every every single set piece for when you enter a room or whatever, it's just like a couple pieces of yeah, furniture. It's here like a fireplace and then like two chairs and like that's it. Yes. Or like a table, like and a dining table. another kind of, I guess... Uh, example of how it kind of does for like uh those old style paintings and stuff like that is mm-hmm. it wasn't there wasn't like it wasn't convoluted yeah with the framing and stuff like that yes absolutely i cannot believe that you said there, there was only one surviving print and that every version that we see stems from that print that's yes. crazy yeah and it's surprisingly like very clean in comparison to so many other like nitrate uh mm-hmm. films that we see now today yeah like Metropolis is a good example. Yep. That one mm-hmm. is kind of butchered on a lot of yeah. on a lot of scenes. Very difficult. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, we brought this up already. Mm-hmm. Uh, stop motion photography yep. was implemented. We literally just on the screen. It just happened. It, yeah. it just happened. It just happened. It was implemented in a couple scenes to give the effect of levitation. Um, the first film to ever use the stop motion, I had to look it up, was the Humpty Dumpty Circus. It released. 24 years before New Sparta 2. I thought, I thought that this would be like sort of 
innovative in a way because I thought that there wasn't a lot of films to do it beforehand, but that was actually not the case. We forget sometimes how far, how deep film history is and like how, how far like those techniques and those innovations go. Like when you think of the first color film, a lot of people think like Wizard of Oz and all that, but in reality, it's like uh, George Millier was coloring his films before, like yes. anyone, you know. Yeah. Even maybe that's why they had to, to to say it's the first technicolor technicolor film. <laughs> film. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Just to specify. Mm, yes. Yeah. Um, the filming took place in many locations. Uh, most of it was shot in Germany, specifically Lubeck and Wismar. Uh, Transylvania scenes took place in northern Slovakia, mm-hmm. a place much closer than Romania. Uh, the only exception to this was the one exterior shot of Orlok's castle, which was Orava Castle in a village called Orovsky Pazimanva. Uh, let me show you. I mean, look at that. I mean, like that frame within a frame right yep, there. there so you go. Good. We're watching it on the TV if, if, as we're talking about it, rewatching it on and the TV. I can't bring. So, it what were you trying to. Um... The, the castle that it was uh, shot at. It's insane. They only show a certain like section of it but really? it's like it's to people do you mean like massive the no like in in the in the oh film, in the film yeah. they really don't you don't get to see uh the, the whole length of it it's it's massive right and i cannot load it so i can't sh- i'll show you later is, is, it, is it one of these yes yes they have like a video of it and it, they show the whole thing look at that thing it's Whoa. massive yeah that's huge orva orava orava orovsky orovsky Okay, yeah, that's that's a gorgeous yeah, Rav, castle. Yeah, Rava Castle. Um, and the very last scene was shot at Starhad, a decaying Slovakian castle. Okay. Um, how did these locations impact the setting of the film? Oh, is that your next question? That is my next question. Well, all films, I, I used to say this when I make my own short films, is like location is paramount. Totally. No no pun intended, <laughs> paramount. Uh, but it's, it's, it's the truth. It's... It's half, it makes half of your film almost. That's why production design is an, is an above the line worker. Because production design is so important in all films. Especially these films, these uh, 1920 silent films or any silent film. Because like the locations are the things that evoke emotion out of it. Because you don't have uh, color, you don't have sound. I mean you got music and visuals. Mm-hmm. And half the visual is the locations. Yes. So you need those locations to evoke that certain emotion. People can rely a lot less on that now. Even, but even with like when you green screen something, that green screen location has to evoke that certain emotion you're going for. And in this, they just they, they outdid themselves. I mean, look at on the screen right now. I mean, that location right there, it just seeps. It just seeps the frame with the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. So the location like evokes, and it also evokes the time period as well because. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but this is a period movie because this movie came out in the 20s, late 20s, Mm -hmm. and this film takes place in what, the 1600s? Technically, yeah, yeah. So it is a period film, so that's crazy. So, I mean, in this, I'm just going to compare it to like, even films nowadays, they have the tendency to just like, show uh, a sign of a place, and then they just throw you in this other place and it's like, well, we're in uh, we're in Vancouver now or whatever. And it's we're in, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're we're in but San it, Francisco. And, and, How are we gonna t- show it? Show and the it's bridge? like, but you're not. You're <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you're, I don't know. It, they get lazy with it, and uh, especially, I guess, with films, even during this time, why this film was like so ahead of its time was because you had on location filming that most people just really didn't do this. They went mm-hmm. all over the place yeah. to, to get good shots and they got great locations out of it. Um, when you're taken to the castle, you uh, travel onto this uh, this horse carriage and you go through this really deep forest. Yeah. And so many people would just kind of skip that. I mean, this is, it's it's tra- transportive. It takes you to this, to this mm-hmm. place. And... I mean, you got so much greatness out of it. Like even the uh, the white water river mm-hmm. like scene that they showed you. Like yeah. it's just taking you from one place to the next. It's not it's not trying to trick yeah. you in any sort of way. No, it, it's drenched in in realism. Yes. Mm-hmm. So just 
I just I love it. I just love yeah. the way the way that they put this together. It's presented so well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the film, a vampire trope was born, not canon to the book. In the book, solar rays are said to weaken a vampire, but in Nusferatu, the sun is fatal. It ends with Nusferatu fading into a cloud of smoke when the sunlight enters the room. How do you feel about the changes that they um, that they've made to vampires? In over general. time. Wow. See, I actually didn't know that that's where that cliche stemmed from. That yeah. sunlight would uh, kill vampires. Uh, James Rolfe has actually a pretty good video on vampires. And he talks about how vampire lore has changed over time. With things like garlic, crucifixes, Honestly, silver bullets, all this stuff. I did some research on it mm-hmm. too, a little bit. And it, it seems like there's a lot here that... <laughs> is kind of the same as like European folklore mm-hmm. um, for vampires. I have like a list of different things that are canon to vampires, and mm-hmm. it's like not that outrageous what uh, Bram Stoker came up with in mm-hmm. the book comparatively. Like the right. original European folklore depicted vampires with fangs. Mm-hmm. They sometimes uh, had a reflection and sometimes had a shadow. Mm-hmm. Um, they were considered nocturnal, but they didn't die to sunlight. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything from decapitation, fire, garlic, holy symbols to stakes could kill. It's see, that's the thing. It's it's kind of like here and there. It, it, they always it's it's varied depending on which part of the world that you're in. Yeah. Um. Uh, they had supernatural powers, including shape shifting. They were yes. inhabited by demons, which is where most of their power came from yeah. or that's what was to be believed mm-hmm. and they were fertile fertile really <laughs> i don't know why they, i put that in there but all right not, hey and, the more you know in all honesty like th- this film in particular m- simplified everything about uh vampires in general yeah we really don't un- know too much about his his powers it really just kind of relies on uh the imagery of him uh, and his his like uh, makeup work and stuff yeah. like that to kind of bring out uh, this terror as opposed to seeing like, and this is totally something like Millier would do where like he mm-hmm. would just uh, puff and then it would, he would just be, there would be yeah. a flat uh, bat flying around the room. Yeah. Uh, it's completely different. So here's an interesting question for you. Obviously Bram Stoker's Dracula is like like that's the inception of the modern vampire or whatever Mm -hmm. but would you say a lot of people might think it like i'm curious between this versus the universal version of dracula would you say that nosferatu is i have a question for you now and i'll answer your question in a second but would you say that nosferatu is like the modern blueprint or the blueprint for the modern vampire like more so, at least in our culture, would you say that's more so? Probably not, only because they get so ridiculous and carried away with uh, how they become betrayed. I think like one example that is completely outrageous, and this came from the Americans' take much later than the European uh, mm-hmm. take, was they have to be invited in. Yes, and yes. it's like, where did that come from? Yeah, is it because like? They had to trick themselves into believing this so they they could sleep at night. You know what it seems like? It seems like a plot convenience. That's it's so. Plot, <laughs> that's the thing. That's um. I was talking to my friend about uh, Bram Stoker. She was not a fan of the the, the book. Um, she mm-hmm. said there was just too many plot conveniences that like he would sprout a new power every time something bad yes. would happen. Yes. And I think that uh, most. Most Dracula and like vampire films that I have seen in my experience with them, mm-hmm. they they tend to do that. They tend to throw just mm-hmm. a lot of nonsense your way and just make it as supernatural as possible. I mm-hmm. kind of appreciate the more uh, minimal approach that Nusferatu yeah. did, but I do not think that's necessarily the, the, the blueprint. blueprint for the modern vampire. I, yeah. yeah, I can see where you're coming from. To answer your question though, what was your question again? It was. How um, how they they change the tropes like how, how, do you how feel they change about the tropes tro- yeah um, it is interesting because the vampire has it, it's an evolving folk tale I guess you could say yeah. tall tale whatever you want to call it mm-hmm. it's an evolving story and everyone is putting their two cents into the pot you know what I mean everyone is always adding something to the vampire lore um, the changes I feel like might have been it could have been budgetary even. Mm-hmm. Or they could have been for convenience for the film because mm. 
you know, shape shifting that in the 1920s film would not have, you know, that not, would be very, very well. that, that would not have played very well. So he doesn't really shape shift in, in, in Nosferatu. And, um, although there is like a, like a sort of a, an implication about rats and mm. stuff like that, which I'm sure we'll get which, into later. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah. yeah, um, I think, I think the, the tropes worked better for this film or, or like the changing of the tropes or creating of the tropes even, I mean, worked better for the film, and they've stayed with the lore of vampires and vampirism since then. So vampires die in sunlight, and if what you say is true, that this is that's basically where it stemmed from, where they actually die in sunlight. I mean, that's I mean that's iconic right there. Yes, you know, it's yeah. I guess that's true. They they have mm-hmm. it has made an impact even on tropes of vampire films. Mm-hmm. Um. Speaking of which, about the rat thing, mm-hmm. and this is um, this is completely off topic, and I do not have anything about this in my notes. Mm-hmm. But um, expressionist film de- generally have like some sort of like um, realism involved into it, and and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And this film might not have been obviously realistic in any sort of way, but it it, it does take this like fantastical approach to something that was real and that thing being the the whole rats and the symbolism with that was uh dedicated to the plague yes and the one thing that this film did have uh that was realistic about it was that it tried to connect um that medical mystery of what happens when Nusferatu gets a hold of you it was kind of similar to the Black Plague, no one understood why all these people were dying. Yeah. And you had that, you had that scene where like basically an entire town was like infected by it. Uh, and you know, there's that, you know, it's just a parallel yeah. to that, to that entire event. So it's almost like Nosferatu was an allegory for the plague. And this is a 1920s film. So it doesn't come off subtle. They basically just tell you. They say it. Yeah, it, it's not even... it Because I heard before I, I saw this movie that it was like a metaphor for it. But it's not really a metaphor. It's literally it's, a part of it's the pl- premise. It's a plot. It's a, to, yeah, it's, it's a part plot of the device. plot. Yeah. And um, it's interesting. And I really wonder kind of what Murnau was trying to say with that. You know, maybe he was trying to, to, to say something. You know, or maybe it was just part of the plot. That people were starting to catch wind of Nosferatu. Or Count Warlock, rather. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of, that's when people start to get on high alert, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh-huh. um, Hit me. now, now, this is a completely, like, subjective question. Subjective. Would you consider Nusferatu to be creepy to this day as a film? It's interesting because our sensibilities, especially when it comes to horror, have changed so much. I often think about what would happen if you took one of like the modern horror films. Like, because I said this to you when we were watching it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I can just imagine the people in the theater like screaming their heads off. For certain films today, yeah, yes. No, I mean like with oh, Nosferatu. Oh, oh, I was with about. Nosferatu. Um, mm-hmm. no, like I can I can imagine like audiences in the 1920s, yes, like watching it for the first time. Like being terrified of it, and you know, I I, I bring this up to you all the time. Mm-hmm. It's a line I drop. Uh, our greatest fear lies in anticipation, mm-hmm. and maybe it's because we we know what the limitations of these films are. We yeah. know that you know he could he can appear very creepy, and he can mm-hmm. he can uh, that shadow can come towards her room yeah. and stuff like that. But yeah. we know once he gets there. What can they really show, like how, mm. compared to like what we see today? Yeah, nothing's really gonna happen from it, so we're kind of like at ease. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, because you always got to put yourself in the the shoes of the people who watched it during the time, because mm-hmm. every film is gonna be dated by, in, in some capacity, no yes. matter what, no matter what, technically, story wise, anything, it's gonna be dated. But we don't know, like what movies in general are going to be like a hundred years from now yeah you know they can blow what we have out of the water exactly so we're terrified by something like by james wan's films or something like the conjuring but you know but that's 
like that's as far as our limitations can go. Like we we are limited by that. Like you that's said, that's as far as our imaginations can take yes us. can can take us at the moment. And that going back in the day, it's the same thing. It's like the same mentality of like this is what they had, and they, this was like the pinnacle for them. Like mm-hmm. this was the pinnacle of film and technology and stuff like that. And uh, they never even dreamed about what we have now. So to put yourself in their shoes watching this film for the first time, it, it must have been like extremely terrifying. For today's audience members, would I say it's still scary? I would personally say no. Yeah. I have a friend, David, who is terrified of horror films. Mm-hmm. He does not watch them. He doesn't like them. He's trying to get into them, but he, he is terrified baby of Baby steps. It's baby steps. He could easily watch Nosferatu and not be terrified. Yeah, like I like that's just the truth because it's a very old film. But I will say, taking sections of this film and maybe placing them out of context, I think could be creepy. Yeah, you know, I think uh, yeah, I think there's definitely a difference between creepy and scary. And scary this film's yes. definitely not scary, not no. in the least bit. No. But I think, at the very least, it, it it's creepy in the sense that what it's going for is. Let's put it this way. They do a really interesting thing in this film. They kind of take Nusferatu and kind of get you comfortable with him during the daytime. He's yes. kind of almost like a, a goofy looking character when he puts on the hat and he's, you know, he's just doing paperwork yeah. with, mm-hmm. with parch and ink. And it's like, uh, he's, I mean, he's just a normal guy when you see him in that light, but they're able to kind of like switch gears yeah. and during the nighttime when he's just like walking slowly towards you it's it's a different you can sense that tone change and yeah. it's like it's accomplishing that at the very least it's kind of like the intruder um trope that we have nowadays where it's like you meet someone who's sort of off and then like as the film goes on and on you start to see their true colors and it starts to get more and more terrifying as like who they really are is slowly revealed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of the same thing with Nosferatu in that, in that regard. It's like, yeah, you're introduced to him. And in the book, Bram Stoker's Dracula, there is a, there's, there's a thing of like the, the writer um, is uh, the main, who's the main character. Like he's picked up in a horse and carriage to be brought to the castle. Yeah. And in, all the Dracula movies, including Francis Ford Coppola's, and in the book, it's heavily implied that the driver is Dracula, but we're never, but we don't really know, you know. In this film, it's pretty obvious that it's like we it, can see it, it visually see, that it is him. We can see that it is him. But there, but disguising it in the form of a book is, you know, it's a little bit different than, mm-hmm. than ha- disguising it on a film. It's kind of harder to to mm-hmm. do. But. uh... I totally forgot where my train of thought was going with this, but uh, <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I would say it's scary by today's standards, but I think it, there's there are moments of creepy visuals that still hold up, is what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, that's just a that just goes to show like the evolution of of horror. This is kind of like where it started out. I mean it. This is as, as mild as it as it can get, and for that time, that was you know it's probably heavy hitting. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So. It touches on horror touches on that like crazy part of emotion, and and it just shows how cemented horror was as a genre, like since the beginning of film. You know, horror was is one of the OGs. Mm-hmm. You know, horror has always been around. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, I mean, it filmed kind of started as horror, as you see a train coming towards you. True, and you get whatever. scared. That was yeah. the first ever like thing showed to like the public, yes. and it terrified them instantly. Yes, the Lumiere brothers. It's who invented the camera. Like they, uh, for those of you who don't know, they they filmed a train coming into a station. When they showed it to people, they would freak out and run because they thought a train was coming for them. Mm-hmm. And that that goes back to what we were saying about how people's minds are limited to what. Is kind of shown to them, yeah. like they they had no idea of a of, of the of a concept of a motion picture. They yeah they, they didn't understand what a flat surface uh, with mm-hmm. imagery was. They didn't understand 
that it couldn't leave that box. <laughs> yeah. When I was in a um, film history class in film school, not to, that's, I don't like film school, but I got to pull out a film school story here. Okay. Um, we were talking about the history of film and such, and one of the professors was like, the public had to be slowly integrated with things like cross cutting and the close up mm -hmm. because they wouldn't understand it. Like, if you showed a close-up to somebody and you just showed... it, They would think it would just be, like, a head. Like, a, a cut-off head that's still moving. Yeah. Like, they'd be freaked out. They'd be like, what is this, you know? And then one of the students was like, oh, but why, though? Like, I don't... Like, he just couldn't understand that people back in the day had no prior, like, anticipation or assumptions about this stuff. Yeah. They had no prior um, engagement with a motion picture. So, to see a close-up... On a surface of a person's head for the first time, that's a very kind of like weird thing. Yeah. If you think well, about they it. also didn't know that there was a narrative involved yes. early on. They just thought it was just a series of images moving. It was like a, it was like a carnival attraction for yes. a, lo a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's pretty much what I have for Nusferatu, but. Is there any final thoughts that you have on the film? Uh, I mean, we've covered a lot of it in this first inaugural episode of Let's All Go to the Library, but I will say, if you are a cinephile or a horror enthusiast, this is mandatory viewing. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, it's iconic, and it's paved the way for many horror films and just films in general that have come after it. And it's iconic to this day, and it's iconic for a reason. Yeah, some of it might be outdated to modern sensibilities, but even if you don't necessarily, quote-unquote, enjoy the film, you can't help but respect it. Yeah. And that's my final thought. Yeah, if you go back and you watch any film during the, the silent era that came out of, like, America, it's... It's drastically different. This film is like leagues above it. I mean, it's it's it never really did much for like storytelling per se, except for the fact that like visuals had become a way to do storytelling as well. And uh, that has come so far since then. I mean, there's so many films that are style over substance, and this film is definitely one of them. It's like one of the earliest examples of that. Absolutely. It's very stylistic. And when you look at Again, if people look at it and they compare it to films now, you're like, okay, it's very minimal. But it's actually very, very stylistic, oftentimes because of how minimal it is. Yeah. I mean, mm. the camera placements back then, sh like having like uh, like gateways yes. uh, in, in between your, your camera and stuff like that. Overarching, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bushes, uh, like, like watching people inside a bush mm -hmm. or whatever like kind of like eavesdropping using on them. using the setting to create a sense of dread and how trapped you are like with the trees like when they're in that forest like that creates to go to like a couple questions ago like that creates like a sense of dread yes because of you're trapped it's almost you feel like you're trapped and you're in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. and like all those trees are kind of like compressed into the frame it almost looks like yeah there's and nowhere you can go that sort of camera language really didn't exist back then no. that was just maybe perhaps a happy accident yeah, yeah. Probably. When, when when doing when trying to do the um, the prag style mm -hmm. of the the framing, they just happened upon this, and then there, there you go. Now people can can look back, film historians, people that really un have a good understanding of film, and be like, well, this is this is uh, kind of an alternate message that could have been uh, conveyed just from the camera position alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, he doesn't really get more, more impactful than this. Absolutely. So if you saw this at the library, would you check it out? Oh, totally. Absolutely. I love this film. Absolutely. It's a five star for me. What is it for you? Is it a ten? Uh, ten? Man, I'm, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go with my, my gut on this one. Yeah. I've been watching a couple different, like, s silent film stuff that came out from this time. Mm -hmm. Um... I think I gotta go with Ka Caligari as, as my my uh -huh. peak choice for it, but uh, I mean if if in some alternate timeline I would have watched this beforehand, maybe who knows? Right. Well, Nosferatu and Caligari, those are the two that are very much paired together when it comes to yep. German expressionist films, horror films especially. Yes. I mean th this film at the very least definitely trumped it in in camera position, but 
as far as like all the love that went to the setting, I think that that film definitely trumps it. There is some good camera work in that film too. Like when they do the close up, this film doesn't really have too, cl- many, like too, too many, many close ups. No, but they have one in particular where he opens his eyes. Mm-hmm. A, a dead man opens his eyes at like kind of the beginning of the film. Absolutely, and that's you know that was really impressive too. Mm-hmm. But not it's not exactly a ten, but I, I do love the film at the mm-hmm. very least. Okay, somewhere in the nine vicinity. Somewhere in the nine vicinity. All right, well. That's it. That is our first episode. So thanks for uh, joining us for the first inaugural episode of Let's All Go to the Library. We got two new shows coming for you. This one and another one, which will be premiering on October 31st. So uh, stay that's tuned a, for that. That's a, that's exciting, man. You know how we usually do like the the suit or whatever, and yeah. we we do do a uh, <laughs> we do like a line from like a movie and stuff. Let's do one from from Nusferatu. <laughs> no for real uh, just okay just get a get a good old-fashioned so- so-